highlight some of the, um, the things that I think is important, uh, some of the things I've learned along the way doing these kind of jobs. And if you guys have any experience um, working on some of this stuff, you know, chime in and, uh, and we'll all learn from each other's experience and, and doing these kind of things. So with that, let's go ahead and get started on chapter six. So first off, thermostat. Yesterday we talked about uh, the thermostat and its important role in uh, drivability. Um, you'll spend more time on uh, the thermostat and the cooling system when you take the air conditioning and heating, heating and air conditioning class. But with drivability, I have found over the years that there's a lot of drivability concerns that are um, as a result of these little thermostats. And so they're an inexpensive item, they're easy to replace, but they, do, they can cause problems when they malfunction. So um, with the thermostat, if they stick partially open, this will cause the engine to warm up slowly and it can cause uh, a PCM to set a P0128 code, which is a diagnostic trouble code that means that the engine coolant temperature uh, hasn't read this, reached the specified temperature. It can also uh, create issues with uh, rich and lean conditions and stuff when the thermostat is stuck partially open because it doesn't warm up like it should. Um, when it's stuck closed, the thermostat fails. Um, if it stuck, fails when it's stuck closed, then the engine will likely overheat. Now yesterday I had mentioned that uh, it could cause a lean code condition. That's if it's, it's more likely if it's skewed rather than stuck closed. If it's stuck closed, the engine's probably gonna overheat on you. And so when, it, when the thermostat is skewed, that means that it's working, it's opening and closing, but it's not opening far enough or it's not closing all the way. And that's what it means by being skewed. And so when the thermostat is skewed, it's not working within the correct temperature range and there, so therefore the engine can overheat or it can be running too cold uh, if, if the engine is or if the temperature is skewed. Now this one here I'm gonna um, this thermostat here I'll leave it up here on the table so if you guys want to look at it after class or during break or something you can but on some of the thermostats they have what they call a wiggle valve right here at the top and if you notice on the thermostat it's kind of offset just a little bit uh, when you install one of these, if it has a wiggle valve on it, that wiggle valve needs to be at the highest point in the thermostat housing. So, because what it does is it allows air to pass through there. So if there happens to be an air bubble in the system and stuff, it allows it to escape. Not every thermostat has that. Um, a lot of uh, other thermostats are just like this one here that doesn't have uh, a wiggle valve on it. And so you don't have to worry about the orientation on this one when you install it. But these that do, that's just one of the things to keep in mind. They'll fit in there anyway, but if you have it upside down, a lot of times you'll get air trapped in the system and you won't be able to get it out. And it'll be kind of frustrating trying to get the air bubble out of the system. So to replace the thermostat, basically all you're gonna do is just um, Drain the coolant, make sure the coolant is, is uh, not hot. Um, does anybody know how to check to see if it's safe to go ahead and drain the coolant or open the thermos, the radiator cap? Yeah, you, you wanna check to see if the system is hot. If, this, if the cooling system is hot, it could be under pressure. So I usually just grab the upper radiator hose and give it a squeeze. And if it's really hard, I mean, if it feels like it's got a lot of pressure in it, then you don't want to take the radiator cap off right away. You want to let it cool down a little bit. Um, because it could be under pressure and if you take the radiator cap off, it'll, it'll shoot that, that coolant out. And when it comes out like that, if it's under pressure, a lot of times it'll superheat and you could really get burned on that. I've actually had uh, radiators um, working in the industry where I've, there are shortcuts around that where you can open them up when they're still hot, but I wouldn't recommend it. But I've taken radiator caps off when they're hot and it'll shoot coolant clear to the ceiling. And uh, that coolant is extremely hot. Usually it's operating at about 180, 190 degrees under pressure. You take the pressure off and that temperature is gonna spike. It's gonna go up. So allow the, the engine to cool for several hours before um, 
draining the coolant, then drain the coolant, remove the necessary components to get access to the thermostat housing, and then remove the, um, the housing and then the thermostat, clean up all the areas there, reinstall the gaskets, and reinstall the thermostat housing and put everything back together. So it's a pretty straightforward procedure to replace a thermostat, and it's usually pretty easy. They're not very difficult. And they're an inexpensive device to replace. I think the biggest problem I've had with, with some of these uh, thermostats is uh, getting the air out of the system after you're done. So I didn't think about it, but there, there is a tool that's available uh, called a no-spill funnel. Have you ever seen those things? Those things are really cool. You, you actually uh, fasten them to the radiator, and then they've got a little plug in them, and you can fill those up, and uh, it allows the cooling system to burp all the air out and it doesn't it saves all the coolant from dumping all over the floor and stuff they didn't have those filters when i was working in the industry or those funnels and uh, it was sometimes quite messy to get all the air out of the uh, cooling system so before we get on to the the water pump how would you go about checking to see if the thermostat is operating in the correct temperature range? Because that's one of the things as a drivability tech you're going to have to do. You're going to have to be able to check the thermostat to see if it's within the proper temperature range. So we'll, give me some ideas. What would you do to check that? Joe? Yeah, so the scan tool you can look at the temperature with and watch the cooling fans and when the cooling fans come on, look at the service information and see um, what temperature they're supposed to come on at. And are the fans coming on at the right time? And does it say the right temperature? Are you gonna say something different, Jamie? Uh, yeah, I was gonna say you find pressure to the fan that you yeah, so that's another way to do it. So if this thermostat here that I've got sitting on the table is supposed to open at 175 degrees, then I just hang it in some water and heat up the water with a thermometer in it and watch it. And when the water gets up to 175 degrees, it should be open. So are you going to add anything to that to Eric? Okay. Yeah, so that's a, a really, the easiest way to check the thermostat should be pretty simple. I mean, you can look at it on a scan tool, watch the temperature, and if you want to verify, you can get a thermometer and uh, just measure the, the temperature of the engine at the same time. Now, those infrared thermometers, you know, the ray guns that you can just aim at the engine and stuff, those are real easy to use, but one of the things you have to understand how they work to get an accurate reading. When you use an infrared thermometer, what it does is it shoots out a laser beam and it, it's kind of in a cone shape. So the further away you are, the larger the surface area that it's measuring. And so if you're standing, you know, five feet, 10 feet away from the, the engine and you aim the temperature gun at it, it's gonna be measuring an area this big. And it's gonna be taking an average temperature of that entire area. So if you wanna see what the thermostat is, you might want to get real close to the thermostat so you're measuring a small area. My favorite thing to do is using a contact thermometer. So a thermometer that you actually put on the thermostat to measure the temperature. You can buy those for your fluke meter. They plug into your fluke meter. You can touch them to the thermostat. You can also get them actually at the grocery store in the baking section. You can get a decent uh, contact thermometer there. Uh, that goes up to, you know, 300 degrees, which is more than you'll need as an automotive technician for most applications. So, but anyway, so yeah, just verify the temperature that the scan tool is telling you with an actual thermometer reading. And uh, a lot of times that's a, a good uh, verification. So water pump replacement. So there's a couple of reasons uh, or reasons that you would want to replace the water pump. Number one, when you're... Uh, replacing a water pump if coolant is leaking from the weep hole. Now on the weep hole on a water pump, if you have, uh, say, um, a water pump, so if you have one with, there's the pulley right there, and then you have kind of the water pump here with maybe some attachments that go on, maybe some bolts, you know, that attach the water pump to the car. You can tell I'm not an artist, really. But if you have a water pump here, and this is where the, 
the pulley attaches to, so this is the part that spins around, right underneath that on that shaft, there's a little hole. It's called the weep hole. And it is uh, right next to the front seal on the water pump. And when that front seal starts to wear out, it'll spew a little bit of coolant out of that weep hole. And sometimes it gets bad enough that the coolant actually drips on the floor. And so you'll see a puddle of coolant underneath the car. But sometimes it leaks just a small amount and it doesn't get all the way down to the ground before it evaporates. So if you can get a mirror down there, if you can actually look at it, if you can see up under there, if you look at that little weep hole that's underneath the pulley, if there's uh, some crusties on there, then you know it's been leaking. And it probably, the, and once, once you get, start getting water or coolant out of that weep hole, um, you're gonna need to replace the water pump. So, cause it'll just eventually get worse and worse and worse until it, um, it gets really bad. So coolant leaking out of the weep pole. And then if the bearing is loose or noisy, um, that's another reason that you would want to replace the water pump. And then the lack of proper coolant flow uh, from a worn or slipping impeller blades. Um, I had a Cadillac with a 4100 engine in it that came in one time. It was having an overheating problem. And I was having a difficult time diagnosing this thing. The coolant was up, it was clean, it was good. There was a good uh, flow through the, the radiator because I had, you could, uh, with a temperature gun, you could look at the top of the radiator versus the bottom of the radiator and all the way through. So you could see that there was good flow going through the, the radiator, but it, the car was overheating all the time. And what it turned out to be, and I kind of found it by accident, but what it turned out to be is the impeller on the water pump on the inside that spins and, and moves the water through the system. When it got hot, it would loosen up on the shaft and wouldn't spin. But when it was cold, it would stick itself to the shaft again and it would spin. So when the engine was fairly cool, or if it had been sitting overnight or something, you start it up and it would work just fine for the first hour or so that you were uh, running the vehicle. And then all of a sudden that, that impeller would stop moving the coolant and the car would start to overheat. Going down the freeway, it usually didn't overheat. It usually overheated in uh, stop and go traffic and stuff. And the way I found it is I finally had, had checked everything and I'd replaced the thermostat, I'd checked the coolant temp sensor, I'd, I actually drained the cooling system and flushed it to make sure there wasn't a blockage in the, in the cylinder block and in the, in the radiator and then the, the, uh, the heater core and all that kind of stuff. I made sure that everything was good and then put it all back together, it was still overheating. And so I thought, well, the only thing I haven't done is replace the water pump. And on those 4100s, I knew a, a shortcut on how to get the water pump off really fast. It's, a, it's like a four hour job on those engines, but I could get it off in about 10, 15 minutes. So the engine was fairly warm and I was in a hurry. So I pulled the water pump off and the water pump was still hot when I got it off. And I just happened to grab the pulley and the impeller and they spun freely of each other. And they're not supposed to do that. They're supposed to be locked together. So I thought, uh, okay, I found the problem. I set the water pump off to the side. Well, I went to show that to the customer <laughs> and the water pump had cooled down <laughs> and the, the impeller and the pulley were locked together again. I was like, well, you gotta trust me. When this thing warms up, they do slip. That's the reason I replaced your water pump. So but anyway, fixed the problem and uh, they were good to go. When you replace the water pump, there again, you got to let the engine cool down so that you don't uh, um, have coolant going everywhere. Drain the coolant out, uh, remove the necessary components, uh, remove the water pump. Cleaning the gasket surfaces. I got a, a picture that's coming up here that shows you about cleaning the gasket surfaces. Most water pumps nowadays are going to be mounted to an aluminum surface, and you have to be very careful when you clean those aluminum surfaces. Um, this right here is a good example of it. Um, you see this right here is where the water pump gasket is. Goes up and around, up over here. Um, that's on an aluminum timing cover, it looks like. And when you scrape that gasket off, you have to be very careful. If you use a razor blade, you can actually dig into the aluminum. And if you dig into the aluminum too much, now you're going to create a, a situation where the new gasket's not going to seal. And water pumps are not they're not designed for the, the RTV to go all around there. Uh, you see, I, I see this all the time where people have replaced the water pump and uh, 
you'll have the blue RTV or the red RTV that's squished out all over the place where they just RTV'd the crap out of that thing and stuck it on there. Those little pieces, the little chunks of RTV break off on the inside and then they get going through the, the cooling system and they'll get plugged into the uh, uh, radiator. And they'll block off the radiator. They'll plug up the radiator. So not a good idea to use RTV on them unless the, the, the uh, instructions specifically say to, but I've never seen a water pump that says to use RTV on it. I've seen a lot of people do it, but I've never seen instructions tell you to do it. So I usually use kind of a, a gasket scraper, but not a very sharp one. I usually use my Dollar uh, gasket scraper to get those gaskets off. There's some chemicals that you can use uh, that you can spray on there that loosen up the gaskets to make it a little bit easier to scrape. Never ever use a uh, grinding wheel on a die grinder to get those things off. There are actually buffing pads and stuff that are designed for aluminum that they say are safe. The tool guys will they'll tell you, oh yeah, this is safe. It won't damage aluminum. Well, yes, it will damage aluminum. Been there, done that. <laughs> I have damaged aluminum with those things. So yeah, you want to be careful that when you clean the gasket surface off, you're not damaging the gasket surface. So when you put the new water pump on, it seals. We had a water pump in the drivability class several years ago. I think it was right after we moved into this building. It was on a Honda. And Honda really, really likes to bolt their water pumps down. They use like 12 bolts on, the, on their water pump. And their water pump's only, you know, this big. <laughs> it's just a little thing, but they've got bolts all the way around it. Well, we had one bolt that uh, broke off when the water pump was coming off. So I went over and I helped the students get the, the bolt center. We ground it flat, we center punched it, and we were getting ready to drill it out. And it's just a little 10 millimeter bolt, so it's a really small one. And so we got a pretty good uh, hole through the, the bolt, and we got the easy out in it. And I was letting the students do it, I didn't, because they need the experience. And I told them, I said, be very, very careful not to break the easy out. Because if we break the easy out, now we got a big problem. And so a few minutes later, the student comes over and she says, uh, you remember what you said about being really careful about? And I said, yeah. And he sa she says, yeah, yeah, it happened. <laughs> they broke the easy out. So now we had a hardened piece of steel inside of an aluminum block trying to get that out. We couldn't get it out. So I had a decision to make. It's like, okay, what do we do? So I stuck the water pump on there. We bolted it down with every bolt except that one. And luckily it was one of the bolts that was on the top of the water pump. It wasn't down on the bottom. It was up on the top. And uh, so we bolted everything down, put coolant in it, and then I put a pressure test on it and pressurized it to 30 PSI, and it was holding. It wasn't leaking. So I said, okay, well, let's let it set for the entire weekend. This was on a Thursday. So I said, let's let it set for the entire weekend, and if it's still holding pressure on Monday and it's not leaking, we'll call it good. So we did. We let it set all weekend long. Next, next Monday we came in, it wasn't leaking, and it was still holding pressure, still at 30 PSI. So I thought, well, the water pump's good. It's sealed. So now we have an ethical question here. And I'm going to just throw this out and see what you guys will do, and then I'll tell you what I did. <laughs> would you tell the customer that about the broken bolt, or would you just go ahead and put it back together and send the car down the road? Or should you tell the customer that you broke the bolt? The car's fixed. It's not leaking coolant. Do they need to know that there's a broken bolt in there? There's no right or wrong answer to this. This is, this is one of those questions, it's a judgment call that you have to make. And Larry and I were talking about it because um, Larry knew the customer. I didn't really know the customer, but Larry knew him. And uh, so we were deciding, okay, do we tell the customer? Do we not tell the customer? Because the car is fixed and it, there's going to be no problem with it. And so we decided that we would tell the customer. That that was the right thing to do, that we tell the customer we broke off a bolt. So we did. We told the customer. And unfortunately, the customer was one of these uh, people that were, was so anal retentive that he couldn't stand the fact that he knew that there was a broken bolt in his engine, so he ended up selling the car, getting rid of the car. And to my knowledge, that water pump never failed again. So it's one of those things where you have to, you don't want to cheat your customer, you want to be honest with your customer, but do you really need to tell them about a broken bolt if the, if the repair is solid? Uh, you know, that's up to you. Personally, I would probably do the same thing again. I would probably tell them again uh, if it broke off. But 
that's just one of those things where you just kind of have to, sometimes you have to ask yourself, okay, if this was my car, would I want to know? <laughs> and if the answer is yes, then you probably should tell the customer. If, if it really didn't matter to you, then it probably, it may not matter to the customer, so. Here's another uh, situation, kind of a similar ethical question on, or ethical situation on that. We had another car that came in that we were doing a timing belt on. And it was a, a Toyota, I can't remember what model it was. It had, a, it had dual overhead cams. And so the timing belt, when we replaced it, it was quite a complex thing. We had to disassemble both sides of the, the engine. And the student was, I told him, I said, now make sure you use those magnetic trays, parts trays to put your bolts and stuff in. Don't put them up on the cowling of the engine. Well, they were putting them up on the cowling and I came by and I said, need to get those bolts off there because you'll drop something, it'll go inside the engine because we had the valve covers off. And you'll drop it and it'll go down inside the engine and uh, then we got problems. Well, they dropped a little 10 millimeter bolt and it went inside the engine. It dropped right down through the exhaust valve and into the cylinder. Didn't notice it or they didn't tell me about it and we got everything together and before we started bolting everything up, we had the belt on and everything. I wanted him to roll the engine around by hand and to make sure that the timing marks lined up and everything. And uh, when we rolled it around to a certain point, boom, <laughs> the engine wouldn't go any further. So we rolled it back and we get to a certain point and it locked up, it wouldn't go any further. And what was happening is when the piston came all the way up to top dead center, it would hit that bolt and lock up, couldn't go any further. And so we got a bore scope out and shined the, the, the light down in there and we found the bolt that was sitting inside the, the cylinder. So then we had to drop it down so the, valve, the exhaust valve was open. Actually, we did it so the intake valve was open because we had a larger hole. So the intake valve was open and then we had to fish something down in there to get the bolt out. And we got the bolt out. No damage whatsoever to the engine because we didn't crank it over with the starter. We were just doing this by hand. We got the bolt out, we got everything back together, everything was cool. Well, this, this customer was actually friends with uh, Bob and Norm that used to work here. And so they told him about that. And told him, well, yeah, the students dropped a bolt in your engine. Well, when the customer came, picked up his car, he could hear a tapping noise and he was absolutely convinced that we destroyed his car, that we caused a problem with his car. And I was very adamant. I said, we did not cause a problem. That tapping noise was already there before we did any work on the car. Anyway, long story short, the college replaced his engine for him, put a new engine in it for him. And uh, when we took the old engine out, we disassembled it. A rocker arm had broken on, his, on the back side of, of uh, the cylinder head and had kind of broken over and that's what was causing his rock his noise had nothing to do with our repair that we did so some information when you give it when you give some information to the customer sometimes you can give them too much information so i mean when we dropped the bolt down inside the cylinder there was no damage to the engine in my opinion there's no reason to mention that to the customer but bob and norm did that caused the customer to have all kinds of anxiety. Because I don't know about you, but when you repair your vehicle, sometimes when you get your vehicle back, you're very hypersensitive to everything that's going on with the, the, the engine. Well, customers are the same way. They bring their car into the shop, they get it serviced, and then when they take it back, they're very hypersensitive to all the different little squeaks and noises and everything else that they may hear. They were probably there before, they just didn't notice them. So, Intake manifold gasket inspection. Intake manifold gaskets is where you find a lot of drivability issues. Um, when they start to break down, you'll get all kinds of different things. You'll have oil leaks, you'll have coolant leaks, you'll have vacuum leaks uh, in the intake manifold, all of which can uh, end up with a drivability concern. So when we inspect the uh, intake manifold, you'll need to look for vacuum leaks, you'll need to look for coolant leaks, you need to look for oil leaks. So a couple of ways that these guys can leak, some of the, the uh, intake manifolds can leak, is uh, with a vacuum leak, 
the gasket starts to deteriorate, it breaks and it, you have, it starts sucking ambient air in. So in other words, we call that unmetered air. So it gets air into the engine that the uh, mass airflow sensor doesn't know about, the PCM doesn't know about it. And so it can cause the engine can, to run improperly because the mass airflow is reporting to the PCM how much air is going into the engine and the PCM is delivering fuel based on that information. Well, if you got more air that's going into the engine than the mass airflow is reporting, you're not getting enough fuel. So you're running lean. And uh, leans, lean running conditions can cause misfires and different things like that. can co also cause uh, excessive temperatures on your engine. So uh, there's different things like that that can be created with a misfire or with a, uh, a vacuum leak. So there's a couple of different ways you can find vacuum leaks um, with intake manifold. Uh, number one is a smoke machine. And I know I asked you a couple days ago how many of you have used the smoke machine. There wasn't very many of you that have. So I will do a video on, on how to use the smoke machine, show you what we can do with it and, and how to use it. They're real easy to use. But basically, you're just filling the engine up with smoke, and you can look to see where it's coming out of. And a lot of times, it'll point you right to the, the, the uh, vacuum leak. My favorite method is uh, using propane. So... And I've got a video up on Canvas for you that you can watch and see how to use propane to, to find vacuum leak. If you, and you can make a little propane tool real easily. Um, I made mine out of a, a soldering torch you can buy at Home Depot. Uh, I actually found one at a yard sale for like a buck. It was one of those little torches that you screw onto the propane tank. Found it for a dollar at a, gr a garage sale. And I just took the tip off of, off of it and put a hose on it and then used a ballpoint pen as my pointer and then you can crack open the propane and then you can use that tip to go around all the gaskets and when the rpm raises or smooths out you found your leak it's real easy to do you do want to make sure that you don't have a spark plug that's zapping to ground because <laughs> if you go squirting propane around a flame or a spark it will ignite so that's the only caution to it but anyway so that's vacuum leaks on there you can also um um, coolant leaks, uh, the intake manifold gasket seals the cooling system with the uh, um, oil system and it keeps them separate. And a lot of times when your intake manifold gasket will fail, you'll get coolant that gets into the oil or vice versa. You might get oil into the coolant. So you take the radiator cap off. If you see a whole bunch of oil floating on the, the top of the, the radiator, there is a possibility you could have a, ga a gasket leak, whether it's an intake manifold gasket or a head gasket or something like that. And then when you're changing the oil, and if you pull the dipstick and it's kind of that uh, mocha color, looks like coffee uh, in there, that is uh, moisture that's getting into the, the uh, oil. And so you could have a coolant leak either through a head gasket or an intake manifold gasket getting coolant into the oil. Once you get coolant into the oil, you only have just a couple hundred miles and that engine's shot. So just FYI, if you, if you see that, we call it a milkshake. If you get a milkshake inside your engine, you only have a couple hundred miles and you're buying a new engine. Because what it does, it destroys all viscosity in your oil. So you have no lubricating properties whatsoever. Now you got metal to metal and it tears up your bearings in just a short period of time, really short period of time. So. Anytime I found um, a milkshake that was inside of an engine, I always recommended to the customer that we at least need to tear it down and look at the bearings. Because if the bearings are worn, we need to look at it doing either a minor overhaul or a major overhaul or an engine replacement um, when that happens. So, reasons for failure. Um, the intake manifold gaskets will fail because of expansion and contraction rate that I mentioned the other day. Uh, you have steel surfaces and aluminum surfaces. Steel and aluminum are going to expand and contract at different rates. It can cause gasket flexing and it can cause gasket failure. Uh, if the gasket was installed improperly, uh, that can also cause a leak. Um, and age, age and mileage. You know, gaskets get old, get old and sometimes they fail. So, and another thing that also causes gaskets to fail and this is something you might want to make your customers aware of, is when you replace components. I'll give you an example. I had an old uh, uh, 1994 Ford Ranger. 
and love that truck. It's V6, little 4.3 liter V6, and uh, I was having some cooling issues with it. The uh, water pump went out on it, so I replaced the water pump. Now I got a brand new water pump on there, and it's pumping coolant through that system like, like it's supposed to, and now I got a radiator leak. <laughs> so I replaced the radiator. And now I've got a brand new water pump and a brand new radiator and the cool or the heater core starts leaking. So I replaced the heater core. And this is after I'd already replaced the hoses because the hoses started leaking too. And then after I got everything replaced, the thermostat, the hoses, the radiator, the um, heater core, now the freeze plugs start leaking <laughs> on the engine. And what was happening with this is you put a brand new water pump on there and the old water pump was wearing out, so it probably wasn't pushing the volume of coolant through the engine that it needed to. Now I've got a brand new one on there. Well, I've got all these other components that are worn out too, because the car had like 250,000 miles on it. And uh, so it started, all these other components started wearing out as well. So you may want to tell your customer that. So if you're replacing gaskets or if you're replacing like a water pump or something like that, well, just let them know. Just say, hey, look, you know, the water pump's good, but make sure you do a good in inspection on your radiator and your heater core and all that other stuff to make sure that uh, just because you put a new water pump on there, you might have another issue that crops up over here. And that happens quite a bit with drivability issues. I mean, um, and sometimes one of, the, one of the things I will mention is uh, with the modern technology that we have on engines, the PCMs and, and everything, our technology is to the point where the computer is really, really good at compensating for failures. So if you have an, in, an injector that's not firing properly, the engine will do its best to compensate for that. And you'll see when we start messing around with this Pontiac engine and stuff, if I create a misfire or something like that, you'll see a problem for just a minute and then all of a sudden the engine starts smoothing out and looks okay again. It's because the PCM starts compensating. And so when you start fixing or when you start diagnosing and trying to fix a drivability issue, a lot of times um, you'll fix one part of it and there will be another issue as well that the PCM has been hiding from you that will show up now that this problem's fixed. So you re that's why, you know, um, verifying your fix and making sure that you've fixed it right the first time before you give it back to the customer that we were talking about on the first day. That's really important is to make sure that you do that. So if you have coolant going into the cylinders like right down here, um, what would be the symptoms? What would be some of the things that customers complaining about? You have coolant getting into the cylinder. Smoke, what were you saying, Joe? Mm -hmm. So you have a, the coolant that starts dropping off, so you have uh, uh, the level of your coolant starts fall, dropping. And if you notice that your coolant starts dropping quite a bit and there's nothing on the ground, uh, that might be an indication that you're burning it smoke coming out of the tailpipe and it's usually white smoke. Now we're coming into today, yesterday, today's first day of fall. Anyway, we're coming into cold weather. And usually when you get out there and you start your car up, there's going to be some white smoke coming out the tailpipe, which is normal. But if that white smoke doesn't go away within like a mile of driving, then you've got a problem. That's well, that white smoke should go away. Um, but if it's still smoking when you're two or three miles down the road, you might want to look and see if you got a problem. When you have coolant in the in the exhaust, it has a very kind of a sweet smell. I always it almost smells like burnt celery or something like that to me. Anyway, that's what it smells like to me. But it's kind of a distinctive smell. Um, but that's how you would tell if you've got coolant in your cylinder. The other way you can tell is if you're doing a, a tune-up or something, you pull all the spark plugs out. If you have uh, green ethylene glycol in your engine for coolant, if you have all your spark plugs out and lined up and you have one green one, an engine that, or a spark plug that looks kind of has a greenish hue to it, you probably have a coolant leak in that cylinder. 
you can get a borescope out and you can look at it and if all of your pistons look you see a little bit of carbon on top of each one of the pistons except you stick it into this one cylinder and it looks like you've uh, somebody has steam cleaned the engine I mean the piston looks all bright and shiny you might have a coolant leak in that that uh, that cylinder so those are a couple other ways you can tell if you've got uh, coolant going into your cylinders so with the intake manifold you want to do a quick visual inspection and uh, a lot of times if it's a vacuum leak or something like that you sometimes you'll be able to hear it you'll be able to hear it sucking in air uh, look at the coolant level um, so this is what I mentioned here with the coolant level if you check the coolant level and determine that the coolant level has been dropping but you don't see anything on the ground it could be uh, um, a gasket leaking and then air and vacuum leaks so and then to replace it here again it's pretty similar procedure so uh, make sure the engine's cool drain the coolant um, remove the necessary components uh, ensure the manifold doesn't warp when you're pulling a, if it's a, a manifold a, a big manifold on the engine a lot of times there's uh, bolt sequences you have to loosen the bolts in a certain sequence and you have to tighten them down in a certain sequence so always make sure you check your service information when you're doing your repair. I, hate, I don't like to do any repair on a vehicle. It doesn't matter how much, how much experience you have. I don't like to do any repair on a vehicle without consulting the service information first and even during the procedure. Uh, because sometimes there's little things that, uh, that you're supposed to do that you may not know about that are manufacturer specific or car specific or whatever. So make sure you look at your service information before you um, start doing that. Some uh, uh, intake manifolds are broken into two parts. There's an upper plenum and a lower plenum. Uh, my Suburban's that way. It's a Vortec, and it's got an upper plenum assembly. It's got a lower plenum assembly. And you can separate those, and you can service them separately. But when you put them back together, you need to make sure that they uh, go back together um, correctly and that there's no uh, leaks on it. Some intake manifold gaskets as well are reusable. Uh, you can actually remove the intake manifold gasket and reuse the gasket when you put it back on. But you still need to inspect it and make sure that it's in good condition before you do that. Thoroughly clean the area before you uh, put it back together, make sure you get all the old gasket material off of both surfaces, off the intake as well as off the cylinder heads and the engine block. Uh, make sure everything's cleaned up and dry when you put it back together. Uh, and then torque all, all fasteners to uh, factory specifications. And a lot of times that even includes uh, torque angle. So not only do you torque it down to the right foot pound or inch pound, but you also go the additional angle that you need to. So here's a couple of examples of uh, intake manifolds, uh, upper and lower. So this would be the upper intake and then the lower intake down there. So depending on the, the application. These are plastic intake manifolds here. Ford used those quite a bit. GM's used them a little bit. Uh, and I'm sure there's other manufacturers that have used plastic intakes. Uh, plastic intakes are really critical that you torque them down correctly because you can actually, if you torque them down improperly, you can break them, you can crack them, and now you have a vacuum leak. Uh, Ford actually had a, a recall, it wasn't a recall, it was a campaign out um, back in the late 80s or early 90s where they had these uh, plastic intakes that would crack over time and cause a leak. And so they reinforced it and redesigned it a little. And uh, so when you replace it, you replace it with an updated version. Some intake manifolds have a pressure relief valve. I'm trying to remember. I had a, a car come into the shop here. Oh, it was probably about 12 or 13 years ago that was having a drivability issue. And it was this uh, spring-loaded pressure, pressure relief valve was stuck open. He'd had a backfire and that thing popped open. What this is for, this is in the intake, one of the intake runners, and when you have a backfire, what you're doing is the, the fuel ignites outside of the combustion chamber. So if you have, 
air and fuel inside the intake manifold or into the exhaust manifold. Um, and then you have a, an ignition source of some type, a spark or something, or heat uh, hot enough, it will ignite it and it will cause kind of an explosion either inside the, the exhaust manifold or inside the intake manifold. Well, that sudden explosion can cause a spike in pressure and it's a spike big enough that it can break manifolds. Um, I've actually seen it blow mufflers clear off the car. Just boom, and it blows the muffler right off the car. So what the, the way they uh, try and protect this is they'll put a pressure relief valve inside the intake manifold. So if you do have a backfire, this allows the pressure to escape so it doesn't break anything. Well, he, this guy had had a backfire in his engine and this uh, pressure relief valve stuck open. So now he had this giant vacuum leak in his engine. And we ended up finding it and had to dig in and replace that, that valve. So that was kind of a unique um, experience. So replacing the intake manifold, uh, reinstall all the parts and allow the engine uh, to start and refilling the coolant and all that kind of stuff. And then you want to check it again for leaks. So when you're diagnosing the vehicle, you're checking it to see if you've got any leaks. After you're finished fixing the vehicle, you need to check it again to see if there's any leaks. Because as good as we are, sometimes we make mistakes and you want to make sure you catch those before you send it out to the customer. Because when the customer picks up their car, have you ever noticed that the customers, they drop your, their car off and they want you to service it the day before they're going on a big vacation? That's the worst time to service your vehicle. You want to service it a week before you go. So you got time to drive around and fix anything else that may be wrong. But, you know, I'm guilty myself, you know, putting off fix or servicing my own car until the day before I leave. So anyway, the other things that you want to check as well when you're doing this is check and replace the air filter and uh, change the oil, do all that. All that simple maintenance every time you're doing this. When you're doing the intake manifold especially because you have to drain all that stuff anyway. So you might as well, you know, put all fresh fluids back in it for them, stuff. Now, timing belts. Anybody here uh, already done a timing belt or two or three? There's two jobs that you're probably going to do right off the bat when you get into the industry. Timing belt's going to be one because almost every car's got timing belts nowadays. And so you do, that's a real popular job to do. Head gaskets are the other. So head gaskets and timing belts, those are two jobs that everybody gets to do. Um, I've got some timing belts here. So the timing belt, basically what its job is, is it, uh, it connects to the, the crankshaft and then it connects to the camshaft and it times them together. So when the crankshaft goes around, it spins the camshaft. So there is a relationship between the two. How many times does the camshaft turn around compared to the crankshaft turning around? Anybody know? Right. The crankshaft is going to turn twice for every one revolution of the camshaft. And you can uh, see that pretty easily um, by looking at the pulleys. Oh, by the way, this right here is kind of a workaround where you can pick up all data on your devices, your phones and everything. It only works here at the college. But if you want to, if you're standing out there working on a car out in the, in the shop, you don't have to go into the tool or into the computer resource room to look at all data. You just type in my.alldata.com forward slash IP and you can get into all data that way. I haven't tried it to see whether it works on an iPhone or not, but I'm told that it works on Android. Is it? Cool. Yeah, we were excited about that. We were, trying to, we were trying to work with IT services to get all data out here in the shop because with the social distancing nonsense and stuff that we got to do, you can't have a lot of people in the resource room. Have you? Oh, right on. That's even better. So don't log off. Pro demand is easy because uh, it's, uh, it's always been that way, but all that has been a little more touchy because um, 
ProDemand goes by, uh, I think, IP addresses, and uh, all data is loaded on a server. So, but all data is on a server, so that's always more difficult. You have to be logged into the server. So anyway, back to the timing belt. We have a camshaft pulley, and we have a crankshaft pulley. Crankshaft pulley, and I know my, my dimensions are a little off, but the crankshaft pulley is usually half the diameter of the camshaft pulley. So because it's half the diameter, it's going to spin two times for every one time that the camshaft turns. So um, does anybody know what the engine acts like, how it, how it works, if the timing belt breaks? Yeah, it just, it, everything stops, right? It won't run, it won't start. And when you crank it over, um, if you have a, there's two types of engines. There's a non-clearance engine and a clearance engine. Now, a non-clearance engine, what that means is when the piston's at top dead center, whether it's compression stroke or exhaust stroke, if the camshaft is not timed properly, if one of the valves are open, the valve will contact the piston. So if the camshaft breaks, or sorry, if the timing belt breaks, it no longer spins the camshaft. So there's going to be some cylinders that are going to be having uh, valves that are open. And when the piston comes up, if one of those valves is open, if it's a non-clearance engine, it'll bend the valve. It'll hit the valve. And uh, a clearance engine, it doesn't matter. When the piston's all the way at top dead center, you can open up both valves and it won't touch the piston. So... Non-clearance versus clearance engine. So if you have a non-clearance engine and the timing belt breaks, when you go to crank it over, you're going to have some bent valves. And when an engine uh, cranks with no compression, it has a distinctive sound to it. You know, if you've done a compression test and you crank the engine over, um, you'll hear that rhythmic, that when the engine's running or cranking over. If you have bent valves, it's just going to go, <laughs> it's just going to kind of spin. There's not going to be that rhythmic uh, noise that you hear. And so that's an easy way to tell if you've got bent valves, if you've got a broken timing belt. Um, they actually do have a, a timing belt book. And maybe during break, I'll run, grab one out of my uh, office and bring it in and show it to you. But um, you can buy them on Amazon. You can get them at the parts stores. But basically what it is, it's called a timing belt book. And it, ha it has nothing but timing belt procedures in it. So it has all the different makes and models. You can buy them that will cover a range of years. And it has pictures. It has all the service information that you need to do a timing belt service on all the different vehicles. And it also has a chart in it that you can look it up that will tell you whether the engine is clearance or non-clearance. So if you have a non-clearance engine and you've got a broken timing belt, it's almost a 98% chance that you have bent valves as well. So when you bid out that job, when you're telling, giving the customer an estimate of what the job's going to cost, you need to include that the cylinder head has to come off and the valves have to be done, which is going to increase the cost significantly. Uh, if it's a non-clearance engine, you just have to bid out the, the timing belt and you're good to go. So the way timing belts fail, we've got some in here that have failed. Let's see. This one didn't actually fail, but it uh, it was close to it. But I'll uh, kind of pass this thing around so you guys can see it. But it's um, it's got cracks in the belt. So if you pinch the belt and just kind of roll it like this, you'll see cracks on here. Th what this is, this is the uh, 91 Toyota MR2 had 134,471 miles on it, and it was the original belt. Never been replaced. Which brings us to the next question. How often do we replace timing belts? Yeah, you go by the service manual recommendation, but rule of thumb about how long is that? Some of them are 100,000. I've seen some as low as... Uh, uh, 40 or 50,000 miles where they replace it. Most of the ones nowadays are um, 100,000 100, miles or so. 
If you get to 100,000 miles and you've never replaced the timing belt, it's time. You're going to have to do it. But a lot of times what happens is on these timing belts, you have the cogs that are running in the pulleys. And like right down here, if you notice on this one, the cogs are gone. Now, um, one of the things that happens with most engines is uh, you just slide it down. the Yeah, there you go. If you've got like a four cylinder engine, the engine usually comes to stop or comes to rest in one of four places. And it's, it has to do with the camshaft uh, and the springs on the valves and all that kind of stuff. So when you shut the engine off, it usually rests in one of four places. And so a lot of times it rests on the same place on the, the belt all the time. Now, one of the very common complaints that we have about timing belts is my car was running just fine and I pulled into my driveway and then the next morning I came out and it wouldn't start. Well, when you start the engine up first thing when everything's shut down and you've cranked the engine over, that's when you need the most torque and that's when the, uh, the most torque is actually applied to your crankshaft or to your timing belt. And if you have a timing belt that's almost worn out, when you crank it over, the, the crankshaft here is going to spin on these cogs and if the cogs are all worn and old, they're going to shear off. And so this is actually a very common failure right here that you see on this where all the other cogs are just fine except for right here they're sheared off. And that was, uh, that was probably the complaint on this belt is uh, it, I drove it, in, uh, or drove it home, parked it in my driveway, got out the next morning and my car wouldn't start. So, when you replace a belt, a timing belt, what are some of the other things that you need to replace as well? Yeah. This, this timing belt is, or sorry, this water pump is one that is driven off from the timing belt. And so what you don't want to do is you want, because it's going to cost the customer a little bit of money because usually you have to disassemble a significant part of the engine in order to get to the timing belt and replace the components and stuff. So the last thing you want to do is, is have the customer pay you a couple hundred dollars to do a timing belt. And then a couple weeks later, the water pump goes out because now they've got to pay you the same amount of money to go in there and fix the water pump. Whereas if you replace the water pump at the same time you do the, the timing belt, you're only going to charge them a slight bit of more money, so it's not very much more money to replace the water pump at the same time. And now they're both new, so you don't have to worry about it. So that's, that's a, 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 whenever I bid out a, a, a timing belt, you know, tell the customer, say, hey, you need a timing belt, this is how much it's going to cost you. I always include the water pump, and I also always include the timing belt tensioner. And if it turns out that I don't need the tensioner, well, I take it off the bill and the customer pays less than what I quote them. And I usually talk to them about that first, you know, say, well, your tensioner looks okay. Do you want me to go ahead and put a new one on there anyway, since I'm in it, it's not going to cost you any extra. And if they say, yeah, go ahead, then I'll put it in there. But if they're strapped for cash, they may tell me, no, go, don't do that. So I'll, I'll put their old tensioner back on and take the, the new one off the bill. And then they're paying less than what I quoted them. So, but those are a couple of the things you always want to do. Um, I had a little Mazda MPV minivan. I bought it at the school auction here for 175 bucks, and it had a uh, broken timing belt on it. And so I replaced the cylinder heads, put new timing belt on it. And when I put the new timing belt on, it has one of those uh, hydraulic um, tensioners on it that you have to compress in a vise. And, uh, the tensioner itself was like $200. Well, it was more than I paid for the car. I didn't want to replace it, so I didn't. <laughs> I just compressed it and stuck it back in. Well, when I uh, put it back in, I, I got the timing belt all lined up, got everything all marked up and everything. And when I cranked it around by hand, everything seemed to be fine. But what I didn't notice is that as I was cranking it around by hand, one of the cams, it was dual overhead cam, one of the cams had jumped a tooth. And most of the time you can be off like two, maybe three teeth before it really starts causing issues. But you will see drivability issues with one tooth off. 
but a lot of times they're not really noticeable. So anyway, I start the car up, runs fine. And so I'm driving it around town and everything seems to be fine. My wife and I take it a, on a trip and we're out in Eastern Oregon going up over the Blue Mountains, uh, going into out of Pendleton into La Grande. And I'm traveling up this hill and go to accelerate and this thing has no power whatsoever. And I'm thinking, geez, for a V6, this thing's gutless. Because I'm having a hard time passing semis going up the mountain grade. And uh, so anyway, I get home and I thought, yeah, there's got to be something wrong with this. So I double checked what, uh, the timing that I did and I found, oh, the timing's off a little bit. So I, I cranked it around and I looked and I saw that one camshaft was off a tooth. So I disassembled everything, put, a, uh, put the tooth back on or or uh, timed it right. When I was cranking around, this time I saw the, the same camshaft jump a tooth again. And it was all because that tensioner was worn out a little bit. And so I ended up going and buying a new tensioner and putting it on there and it worked fine. And then I had all kinds of power. Yeah, I had no problem passing semis going up mountain grades after that. But just one tooth off on one camshaft was enough to drop my power pretty, pretty significantly in that V6 engine. So timing belts will usually either break or missing teeth and stuff. I did have an Eagle medallion one time when I was working at a Jeep Eagle dealership. Comes in and I cranked it over and I could immediately tell that the timing belt was broken and it had no compression. So when I got the cover off from it and started looking at the timing belt, a mouse had built a nest inside the timing belt cover. And when he went to crank the engine over, it got stuck in between the timing belt and the camshaft. And so when the mouse went in between there, it, it caused the belt to jump and it jumped enough teeth that it bent all the valves in the engine. So I took the mouse and I put it in a little box and I, I showed it to the customer. I said, here's your uh, $1,000 mouse right here because that's what it cost him to get his car fixed. It was 1000 bucks to get that done. All because of a mouse built in a nest in there. So again, allow the engine to be cool, drain the coolant, remove the necessary components. Uh, a couple of, there's a, there is a couple of tips on replacing timing belts. Um, a lot of times, if the timing belt's not broken, you can line up the timing marks where they need to be. And there is some cam locks on a lot that, that will fit on a lot of different cars where you can lock the cams into place before you take the belt off. And that way, when you put the new belt on, it saves you a lot of time trying to line everything back up especially if you have to take the timing belt off because of a different repair you're not necessarily replacing the timing belt you just need to take it off and put it back on if you lock those cams down and then don't rotate the crankshaft it makes your job a whole lot easier i've seen some guys uh, they'll actually take a zip tie and zip tie the belt to the camshaft pulley before they and then to just take the pulleys off and then when they put it back on they the pulleys will only go on one way they can put them on back that way and get it back in the same. But always, always, always roll the engine around by hand and look and make sure that those timing marks line up before you try and crank it over with the engine and start the engine up. And when I'm talking about cam timing, what I'm talking about is if we have the camshaft here and we have the belt that goes around, there's going to be some marks on here that you have to line up. Now on like some of the Chevys, there's a dot on the camshaft and a dot on the crankshaft and those basically have to be looking at each other in order to be timed right. On some of the Hondas and stuff, you have the cylinder head gap. So if you have the cylinder head right here, a lot of times there's a mark on the pulley that has to be lined up with the cylinder head. Uh, there's other... Um, camshafts where you've got a, a dot up here or maybe a little arrow mark and then some crankshafts you have a little arrow mark that kind of points off to like the one o'clock position or the the eleven o'clock position or something like that sometimes they're pointed straight down it all depends on the vehicle you're working on you have to make sure that you know where your timing marks are otherwise you're not going to get it timed right when you put it back together so there's a difference between ignition timing and cam timing. This is cam timing, timing the camshaft to the crankshaft. Ignition timing is timing the spark with the combustion event in the cylinder. So that's the two different types of timing. 
So this is a good example of a overhead cam. You got your crankshaft down here. This is an idler pulley. This is another one that you probably want to replace when you do a timing belt. So replace the idler pulley, replace the water pump. And if it does have a, a tensioner, maybe a tensioner spring or something like that, a lot of parts houses, they'll actually carry a, what they call a timing belt kit. So you can buy the entire kit. It comes, it comes with all that stuff. And uh, so you just buy the entire kit when you do the timing belt on there. On this one here, it's kind of hard to see from where you're sitting, but right there and right there are the timing marks on that, uh, that crankshaft or that camshaft. And I'm not seeing it down here, but a lot of times they'll use the woodruff key to mark it and the timing mark will be right there. Sometimes it's a little dot on one of the cogs on the pulley. So, but anyway, that's, uh, that's um, how you do a lot of those timing belts. So, why don't we uh, take a, a break so you can get up, stretch your legs, wake up a little bit, and then uh, come back and we'll finish up. Okay, so that's timing belts. So let's talk about engine mounts. Can engine mounts cause a drivability issue? <laughs> yeah. Vibration problems, uh, clunking problems, noise problems, and um, they can also cause the engine to torque a little too much, which can cause uh, things to become unplugged. It could wear, wear through wires, uh, cause vacuum leaks, all kinds of stuff. So engine mounts are something else that need to be looked at and, and replaced accordingly. Um, usually there's two to three, sometimes four engine mounts somewhere in the engine. And a lot of times, just by looking at them, you really can't tell they're broken or not. You almost, almost have to use a pry bar or something and lift the weight off from them first. And then you can see whether or not the rubber is separated in them and stuff. But uh, the job of the engine mount is not only to support the engine or transmission powertrain, but it's also to absorb vibration and different things like that to help the engine run or to make the vehicle run smoother. and and all that stuff. So uh, check for obvious damage, any looser or damaged fasteners. Um, always ask your customer, have you, has your vehicle been worked on recently? Oh yeah, I just had an engine swap. Well, you might want to make sure that somebody didn't forget to put a bolt on or a nut on one of the engine mounts or something like that. So Replacing them is pretty straightforward. You just basically have to support the engine um, and then undo the bolts, fish it out, put the new one in, uh, put the bolts on it, and then take the support off the engine. So, a couple of hybrid precautions. Uh, we're getting to the point now where we see hybrids um, at the shop a little more frequently than we used to. What are some of the precautions that you need to be worried about when you're uh, servicing a hybrid vehicle? High voltage, and that's usually clearly marked, you know, with the the bright orange uh, cabling and stuff like that. If it's bright orange, you know it's high voltage. Don't touch it without proper safety equipment on, uh, or make sure you don't touch it until you've disabled the high voltage. Um, direct current is way different than AC current because with direct with AC current you get that pulsing, with direct current you don't. It's just you're you're stuck. So, and the voltage on these hybrids are high, is high enough that it can lock your muscles so you can't move. So, it can be really dangerous. The other thing is, is anytime you're doing any work underneath the engine, make sure that the ready light is off. What does the ready light mean on a hybrid? Do you guys know? It means that the, actual, the car is actually turned on and it's ready to run. So the engine might not be running, but it's ready to. And so if you're working on it, say for instance you're doing an oil change, and the ready light is on, you drain the oil out, and the battery sensor says, hey, kick the engine on because the battery voltage is getting a little bit low. Got the oil out of the car. It'll kick the engine on. So, or if you're 
disassembling something and the ready lights on and the engine kicks on because uh, it can kick on and off uh, without notice so you need to make sure that the engine is actually off and that's when the ready light is no not on and then usually take that key fob and put it somewhere else away from the vehicle so it's not going to accidentally get turned on again so uh, don't touch any circuits with the orange electrical wires. Always use high voltage lineman gloves whenever you're uh, depowering a high voltage system on the vehicle. And even though you, you've uh, disabled the high voltage system, personally, I always take a voltmeter and make sure that it's disabled. Even when I'm working at the house. You know, uh, over the last year or so, I was doing a remodel on uh, a kitchen. We own, we own a beach house down in uh, Ocean Shores and we was remodeling the kitchen and I replaced the water heater with an on-demand tankless water heater, which meant that I had to run three eight gauge cables over to three different circuit breakers. So there was a lot of power going to this thing. And so when I was working around this, the breaker panel and stuff, I always took my meter and made sure that the voltage was dead before I was playing with it. So it's just one of those habits you get into. You want to make sure that you're safe. So here's your ready light. It's usually somewhere on the instrument cluster, usually around the, where the tachometer is or speedometer or somewhere. There's a little ready light there. Uh, this is a Toyota Lexus hybrid uh, that's showing the ready, ready light. The other thing to be concerned about with uh, engine performance and engine servicing with hybrid engines is they do take a special oil. Zero W20. So you don't, you don't want to be putting uh, uh, 15W30 or 20W30 or 20W40 or whatever. You want to put the whatever is on your oil cap or in the service manual, service information. That's the uh, type of oil you want to put in there. Um, a lot of vehicles nowadays, uh, the oil that you put in the engine makes a difference. You're talking about uh, GDI cars, uh, gasoline direct injected vehicles. If you put the wrong oil in there, it's not going to give you the protection you need for that high, high pressure uh, fuel pump and you'll wear your cams out pretty quickly. So you need to make sure that you're using the right oil and additives. For years, it was kind of funny, uh, for years and years and years, General Motors was like, if you put any additives in our car, we'll void the warranty. And now they're saying, whenever you get our car, use additives in these cars. So it's, it's kind of funny, things have changed. So some vehicles require it, some don't. But make sure that you're using the correct oil uh, that you need to in, in whatever vehicle it is you're working on. You guys laugh, but you know what? This was high tech when I was in college. This is called a cams machine. And it was basically your all data. <laughs> but um, anyway, what this is, this is uh, next section here is going into valve valve adjustment and I do have a video link on here showing you how to adjust valves uh, has anybody ever had the opportunity to adjust valves on a car a couple of you so to adjust valves usually the engine has to be cold uh, so a lot of times you have to set overnight be at room temperature before you start to adjust the valves and you always have to get the service information beforehand the video link that I have on the end of this chapter, and I'll show you where they're at after we're done with the PowerPoint. Um, the video link on there, um, I show you exactly where to go to find the, the uh, service information. You have to know what the intake valve, uh, valve lash is and what the exhaust valve lash is. And then you have to make sure those valves are closed when you adjust the valves. The tools that you need to adjust valves are pretty simple. Most of the time you don't even need this many tools. But you need a wrench or something that you can turn the crankshaft with. You need a screwdriver. A lot of times you'll need a set of uh, pliers and then the sockets and the feeler gauges. And then the torque wrench to tighten everything back down once, it's, once you've got the valves adjusted. So um, most vehicles, uh, the valve adjustment, if the valves are adjustable, there is a service interval on how often you should adjust the valves. I know uh, Volkswagen, if you're dealing with air-cooled Volkswagens, you're adjusting those valves about every 3,000 miles, it seems like. I think it's a little bit longer than that, but still. When I had my bugs, I had quite a few bugs over the years. 
it seemed like I was adjusting the valves probably every, you know, three to 6,000 miles. But it only took a few minutes. The valve covers were right there. You just pop the valve covers off. You could adjust all the valves in like 15 minutes. And they were done. So some of the vehicles nowadays, uh, you don't have to adjust the valves uh, quite that often. You know, every 15, 20, 30,000, 40,000 miles, whatever it recommends. So, but when you're adjusting the valves, uh, you have to disconnect and label everything that uh, that comes off. So all the vacuum hoses and all those kind of things. Um, nowadays we have cell phones, which are awesome. So before you disassemble anything, snap a picture, then disassemble. And when you're going back together with it, you'll always find that you didn't take enough pictures. <laughs> but at least it's a lot easier. When I, back when I was first starting out in the industry, the only option we had was a Polaroid for cameras. And so that wasn't really an option. So what we had to do is we had to tape everything and label everything. And, and that was also back in the days when they had a bazillion vacuum hoses everywhere underneath the engine. Luckily, we don't have that many anymore. So remove the valve cover. Uh, so you've got your uh, valves right here that you're adjusting. And uh, the rocker arms, the camshaft over here on this one. Um, you'll need to locate some way that you can tell if the piston is at top dead center. What I usually do is I use a, a plastic straw to, to determine top dead center. So when you're cranking the engine around, you can drop a plastic straw down in the cylinder and then you can watch it come up. And when it gets to the top and starts changing direction, you know you're at top dead center. Then you only have to determine am I at top dead center compression or top dead center exhaust. And you can do that by looking at the valves. Okay, so on the intake stroke, you're at top dead center. It comes down on the intake stroke. Which valve's open? Intake stroke. So it's the intake valve, right? So the intake valve. And then when the, after the intake valve opens up and then closes, what's the piston doing? Compression. So the piston's coming up on compression. So you watch for the intake valve to open. So you watch the intake valve open and close. When the piston comes up to top dead center, you're on compression stroke. So that's, that's how you want to look at that. And like I say, I, um, over the years, I used to use a screwdriver. You stick a screwdriver down the spark plug hole to watch the piston come up. But the downside to that is uh, if you forget that the screwdriver's there and you crank it over by, you know, bump it with a starter, you've just punched a hole in your piston. So if you use a plastic straw, if, you, if something like that happens, you're not going to hurt anything. So, or a wooden pencil. You stick a wooden pencil down in there, sometimes that. You want something that's long enough so when the piston's all the way at the bottom of the cylinder, whatever it is you're using as an indicator doesn't fall down inside. <laughs> so you can't get it out. So. But there again, if you use something like plastic or wood, even if it does fall down inside, it's not going to damage anything. You just have to be able to figure out how to get it out. A few years ago, I was teaching this, and I had a student that... Uh, was using a ballpoint pen to do that. And uh, I told him, I said, you probably shouldn't want to do that. Sticks a pen down in there. And when he brought the piston up, it smashed the pen. Couldn't get the pen out. So I helped him get the pen out and I told him, don't do that. Sticks it in there again on the next cylinder and smashed it again. I was like, okay. One time I can excuse. Two times, now you're in trouble. <laughs> so. Uh, so rotate the engine um, to get the crankshaft up to top dead center. Uh, sometimes if you have a, this, what this, they're trying to show you in this slide here, and it's not in focus very well, but this little th piece right down here is a timing plate. So that's uh, on the old days when we had distributors and stuff, you could actually uh, time the engine, and there was a timing plate there with a mark on it. If you brought number one piston up to top dead center compression stroke, the timing indicator would indicate zero. And so that's a good way to start. You could start with number one piston, you're at top dead center compression, and then you rotate it around uh, and you can go to the next cylinder in the firing order and the next one in the firing order and so forth. So once you've got the piston at top dead center compression, uh, you're gonna use the feeler gauges and they're gonna be different uh, valve lash for intake and a different valve lash for exhaust. And it's usually around 
you know, 15 thousandths or 10 thousandths of an inch or maybe even six or eight thousandths of an inch or whatever. You slide the feeler gauge in between the rocker arm and the uh, valve. In this case here, they're going in between the, the rocker arm and the camshaft to measure the distance. And if the valve lash is too much, you, there's an adjustment screw on the other side over here that you adjust it up. You can either loosen it or you can tighten it. So, and the, to loosen and tighten the, the valve adjuster is with a nut, it's called a lock nut and a screw. So you loosen the lock nut and then you can adjust the screw. And we actually have a cool little tool in the tool room that I show you in the video um, that makes this job here real easy. Because the, the socket and the screwdriver are all one piece. So you put the socket over there and you got the screwdriver on top. So it's real easy to hold the jam nut in place while you, while you uh, adjust the screw. And then when you tighten the jam nut, you can hold the screwdriver in place. Makes it real easy. So after, the, after you adjust the valves on one engine, so here's, here's the thing. If you're adjusting the, the engine on, or the, adjusting the valves on a four cylinder engine, you just did cylinder number one, and we'll say the firing order is, is one, two, three, four. So you just did the cylinder number one, and now you wanna move to the next cylinder to do the valves, uh, to adjust the valves there. How do you determine if you're on top dead center compression stroke on cylinder number two in the firing order? How many times do you have to turn the crankshaft over or whatever? What's that? Mm -hmm. So you can do it one of two ways. You can count how many times you rotate it around. So remember on a, on a uh, um, four cylinder engine, you got 720 divided by four gives you what? 120 degrees, I think it is, 120 degrees. So you just move the crankshaft 120 degrees and you're on the, at the no, next cylinder in the firing order, top dead center. Because it's going to be 120 degrees in between each, if, I'm, if my math is right. 180. It's what? 180. 180, sorry, okay, thanks. <laughs> I'm, not a, I'm not a math teacher by any means. But anyway, so 180, um, then the, that's going to be the next cylinder in the firing order. Okay? So that's one way to do it. But you've got the valve cover off too, so you can also just crank it around and look for the next intake valve to open. As soon as the intake valve opens up and closes, that's the cylinder that's on top dead center. So there's a couple of different ways you can do it. Another way you can do it, if, you, if you're dealing with a car with a distributor, is you can look at the distributor and see where it's pointing to determine where the cylinders are at. So all kinds of different ways to do it. So, and this is just showing you the different uh, um, things to adjust the valves. Whenever you do a, a valve adjustment on here, especially if you've got um, the spark plugs that are in the center of the cylinder, a lot of times when you take the valve cover off, it's got oil seals around each one of the spark plug towers. Uh, either, at least inspect those, if not replace them. Um, Sometimes they're reusable, so if they're in good shape, you can go ahead and reuse them. But if they're not, have you ever taken spark plugs out and there's a whole bunch of oil around the spark plug? A lot of times it's because those seals are leaking. So if that's the case, you may want to replace those seals as long as you got the valve cover off. So then put the valve cover back on, torque everything down to, uh, down to spec, put the distributor cap back on, put all the spark plugs back on. And here's where... Almost all of the students really um, have an issue is they don't pay attention as to the uh, correct position of the spark plug wires and they get the spark plug wires switched. So you get a couple of wires that are um, switched and now you've got a misfire after you're done adjusting the valves. So I always say double check and triple check um, your firing order because if you crank the engine over and it starts backfiring, that's a timing issue. You most likely have a... Uh, spark plug wire that switched. So and then put all your vacuum hoses back together and uh, double check to make sure you don't have any vacuum leaks and everything before you give it back to the customer. So, so 
So at the bottom of this chapter, this is the, the um, chapter 6 in vehicle service um, section in the module. So you come down here, this is the, the PowerPoint we just looked at. Here's the chapter PDF that I scanned in yesterday. And here's the quiz that you need to take before Sunday um, to, to get credit for that. And then here's a couple of videos. Now there's nothing attached to these videos, so if you don't watch them, that's up to you. But there's good information in here and it goes in, I, I demonstrate what we just talked about in the class. So with this one, this is how to adjust valves. And I did the, the demonstration on our little Toyota 2T engine that we have floating around here in the shop somewhere. And then this one here is finding a vacuum leak using propane, um, which is kind of a, a good one. This one it seems to be quite a popular video. There's a lot of people have been watching it on YouTube since I put it up. So you got any questions about, uh, about this chapter at all? Okay. So next week we're going to start off by talking about um, digital, digital storage oscilloscopes and scan tools. Um, so that'll be Monday. Um, oh, well, that, that's actually, you're going to do that on your own online, but that's going to be the, the first chapter that, uh, that I usually would cover. And then the other two chapters that we're going to be doing next week, each, each week throughout the quarter we've got about three chapters that we're covering. And so next week we're going to be doing chapters 4, 14, and 8. So 4 is oscilloscopes and DSOs, and uh, 14 is ignition systems and diagnosis, and number 8 is misfire diagnosis. So, and as far as tasks go, for next week when you come in for tasks, you'll have, I think, 5 here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. No, you got 6 this week and 5, or 5 this week and 6 next week. So you'll have um, 11 tasks that you'll that you'll have that you can start working on next week. And if you have your own vehicle that you want to do some of these tasks on, you're welcome to do that. Otherwise, I'll have uh, school cars here for you that you can work on. Um, and then each one of these tasks, I am going through each one of the tasks and kind of spelling it out so you don't have to guess as to what you have to do. So like demo and worksheets. Whoops, that's for this week. So those are all the demos and the worksheets that are available for this week. And then for next week, when I publish this one, when you see this come up, here it is for this one. So perform an absolute va manifold vacuum test. Here's how to do it. So when you watch this before you come into lab so that you have an idea of how to do it. And then when you get here, I can help you with it. Okay. So the, the object is, is to watch these videos before you come into lab. And then when you come in, we can do it. So um, this one here is a cylinder balance test. This is a cylinder static and dynamic compression test. Um, this one here is a uh, leakage test, cylinder leakage test. And inspect the condition of uh, exhaust brackets and different things like that. And then move, remove and replace spark plugs, which is something you're going to be doing a lot of this quarter. So, This stuff here, no, because I haven't published uh, week no, two yet. I'll have it published by the end of the day, oh. today. So week number one is published, so you should be able to see all that. Okay. And so week number two will show up today. I'm going to be doing some recording this afternoon um, on lecture videos. So I'll probably publish it before I get all the lecture videos done. So just keep checking back to see when the lecture videos pop up. <laughs> 